We do have um, a number of seats still available on this side of the room if anybody wants to find the seat. Um, if you have seen next to the could you please just raise your hand so we can help people find a seat? So there's a number of seats on this side if someone's looking to sit down. Thank you. And one over here as well. <laughs> yeah, so there's one there. We've got, looks like one, two, three, four, five. At least five more seats over here. If anyone's looking for a seat. Right. Well, thanks so much for joining us tonight. We've got a past room. Just some uh, quick uh, logistics. So we do have the doors open to try to keep it cool in here. We have heard there is no air conditioning, so we apologize in advance a little more. We will try to move through things. Um, with as much information as we can possibly give and to talk through everything. Um, we also recognize it's warm in here. So um, I'll try to make sure we're getting started relatively closely on time here. The restrooms are over in that corner here down this hall if anyone needs a restroom. And then for those in the room, we do ask that you sign in on the sign-in sheet. If you haven't signed in already, uh, please see somebody at the front desk when you're leaving, or we can also have our team come around and pass them up. Of the sign in sheet around. So, with that, let's go to the next slide. And this is a hybrid meeting, so we have people joining online as well. Just so you all know, the camera is right here called an owl. You can probably see yourselves up here on the top screen. That's going to show the room to those online and then also for um, anyone speaking uh, up here so that those online can hear and see. This meeting is being recorded and it's a webinar. So for those of you who are joining online, you do not have any um, talk or uh, camera. We get that question a lot. Don't worry about it. You don't have to worry about muting and unmuting yourself or worrying about your camera being on. Those are automatically off and there will be an opportunity this evening for questions. So we're gonna do a Q and A session. We're gonna provide to you a presentation. Really, this is an opportunity to share more information on this project, on the process, how it all works, be able to answer any questions that you may have. And then we are taking written public comments. Um, at the back of the room here, there's a gentleman with a water bottle right on the gray, uh, the gray box right here um, in the middle of the room. You're welcome to write your comments in on that paper and submit it into that gray box. And for those that are joining us online, you're welcome to submit it electronically to dequopencut at mt.gov. We also have an opportunity for mail and comments, and we'll provide you that address uh, in the next few slides here. Um, so again, if you're interested in rich comments, um, go ahead. There's forms in the back of the room. You can submit it there, and then we'll have opportunity for questions and answers as well. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, for those in the room, if you haven't already, please sign in on the sign-in sheet. This is really important also if you want to be kept up to date on the project. By signing in and including your email, you're on an interested parties list where we provide updates um, throughout the process. So if that's something you're interested in, make sure you're on that sign-in sheet. For those online, we do ask that you sign, uh, sign into the meeting using the chat function. So you'll see on the right-hand side of the screen there, uh, or the left-hand right -hand side of the sharing app, uh, the uh, webinar chat there allows you to type in your first and last name and affiliation, if any. So for those online, if you could uh, fill that out for us, that would be great. Sure. And as always, uh, just please be kind and courteous to one another. We have a number of people here, a lot of people in the room. We want to make sure we're getting questions answered from everyone. Um, and I know everybody uh, is, you know, wanting to be here tonight and having a conversation. So just always being respectful and courteous of one another. Next slide. Okay, so before we go into our agenda for the evening and I turn it over to the group, I did just want to do quick introductions so that you know who is in the room here. My name is Moira Davin. I do public relations for DEQ, and I'm just going to go ahead and start on this end of the table, and I'll go ahead and pass the mic to do introductions. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Nick Bannock. I'm the district manager of the uh, Gallatin Local Water Quality District. It's a non-regulatory branch of the Gallatin County Government. And I'm uh, happy to be here tonight and hopefully I can help answer any questions that you may have as it pertains to water quality. 
Hi, I'm Terry Strassen with the Montana Department of Natural Resources and Conservation, CNRC, Water Resources. So we're going to have quantity and use of Also, here information on Hi, I'm Troy Burroughs. I'm with the permitting group in the human air quality, and I'm, I'm also with the Hi, I'm Anastasia. I'm in overseas and science and I'm reviewing this permit. Um, so here's some information about the application. Hi, I'm Mindy Bausch. I'm the open cut mining section supervisor with the EQ. Hello, I'm Ken Stover, General Manager of TMC, will be the ones that are going forward with this proposal. Ken Murphy, Operations Manager of TMC, and like everyone said, I'm an open answer to give you guys some information about the operation. Marty Gagnon from North Maryland, I will prepare the permit application for TMC. I'm Dave Gates with the Montana Department of Transportation. I serve as our Field District Trade Construction Engineer. Hi, I'm Gene Oliva from Montana Department of Transportation. I'm the Union District Communicator. Hello, I'm Warren Hansen, Fifth Wildlife and Parks, your Region 3 Wildlife Manager, uh, based at here in Bozeman, uh, managing wildlife for Southwest Montana. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we do still, uh, before I turn it over to the agenda at the main meeting, we do still have a number of seats open, um, not a huge number, but there are some. So if you'll please, please raise your hand if you have a seat next to you. So if somebody's looking to sit down, there are a number of seats in the, these two front rows here. It looks like we have one, two, three, four. So if anyone is looking for a seat, there are seats available. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Whitney to talk through. All right. Thanks everybody for being here tonight. Um, we appreciate you all joining us. Uh, we want to provide you with some information about the laws that are related to open cut mining, uh, the general application process, and specific elements of this application for an open cut permit. Uh, we'll then take some time to answer questions that we've already received through public comment and make time for more questions after that. First, what is open cut mining? Open cut operation is defined in Montana state law as activities that are conducted for the primary purpose for sale, sale or utilization of open cut materials. Open cut materials is further defined in state law, and that definition includes sand and gravel, which are the materials proposed to be mined at the black site by TMC Incorporated. Operators choose the location of open cut sites and also choose how the mine materials are used. So the EQ doesn't have any say in the location of the site or how those materials are used once they're mined. Uh, open cut operations are regulated by the Open Cut Mining Act, which is found in Title 84, Chapter 4, Part 4 of the Montana Code Annotated. The Open Cut Mining Act is a group of laws that have been passed by the legislature and approved, and those lines of law like many have been amended over time. The lawmaking process grants the EQ authority to regulate open cut operations by implementing the Open Cut Mining Act. Montana DEQ implements the law by reviewing permit applications for compliance with the law and ensuring that permitted sites are operated in accordance with their approved permits. We do this through conducting site inspections, requiring operators to resolve compliance issues, and ensuring that reclamation is completed at the end of the mine. So broadly, DEQ's role in the process is to use the regulatory authority granted to it by the state legislature to implement the law. So why are we holding a public meeting? Uh, before we talk about the permitting process, let's cover what we're doing here. Uh, Montana law outlines when DEQ must hold a public meeting, and not all open cut applications qualify for a public meeting. This one does because there are at least 10 occupied dwelling units within a half mile of the proposed permit boundary. An occupied dwelling unit is essentially defined as a primary residence. So the Open Cut Mining Act requires DEQ to hold a public meeting if 51% or more of landowners with occupied dwelling units within the half mile of the proposed permit boundary uh, vote to hold a public meeting. So I know that's complicated and convoluted, but essentially DEQ received the right number of votes. So holding a public meeting. 
Can you speak a little bit slowly? Yes. Thank you, Claire. So let's look at how DEQ processes permit applications. There are three main components of the permitting process, and they all happen on the same timeline. They all start and end at the same time. DEQ reviews the application for a permit to determine whether the application complies with the Open Cup Mining Act. Uh, DEQ also conducts an environmental review under the Montana Environmental Policy Act, or MEPA. Uh, and we do that to identify, analyze, and disclose impacts that could result from the permit being approved. DEQ also collects and reviews public comment. We are looking for substantive comments that can inform the review of the permit or the content of the environmental review. So again, all three of these components start at the same time and end at the same time. So let's first cover the application review. The dates on this chart are specific to this permit application, but this generally captures the process overall. The first stage of the application review process is called completeness. When an application is submitted to DEQ, we have five working days to review the application material to determine whether everything that they submitted is or everything that is required for the application has been actually turned in. Uh, this includes a reclamation bond. So DEQ holds reclamation bonds to ensure that sites are reclaimed if the operator is unable to do so. DEQ received the application on May 23rd and deemed it complete on May 26th, and at that time notified the operator that the application was complete. So once the operator has been notified that their application is complete, they have 15 days to notify the landowners within a half mile of the proposed permit boundary. That their application is complete. The deadline for that notification to be completed for this application was June 10th. So I discussed earlier the part of law that requires the EU to hold a public meeting. Um, again, 51% of landowners with occupied dwelling units within a half mile of the proposed permit boundary had to vote to hold a meeting, and we received those votes um, by the deadline, which was July 10th, so 15 days ago. So at that point, once we received those votes, uh, we have to hold a public meeting within 30 days of the voting deadline. So the second stage of the application review process is called acceptability. Technically, this starts as soon as the application is complete, but I wanted to call out the public meeting process on that previous slide. Uh, acceptability entails DEQ staff reviewing the application for compliance with the Open Cut Mining Act. So an open gut scientist reviews the materials and identifies whether there are deficiencies that do not meet the requirements of the act. Those deficiencies are documented in a deficiency letter. For this application, the EQ's deadline to issue the first deficiency letter is August 9th. If no, no deficiencies are identified, the EQ must issue the permit by that same date. So if a deficiency letter is issued, the applicant has up to one year to respond with an up with updated application that addresses those deficiencies. The operator can also make changes to the proposed project in response to the deficiency letter. Once DEQ receives the updated application, we have 10 days to do that same acceptability review and either issue another deficiency letter or issue the permit. So ultimately, if a, an application meets the requirements of the Open Cup Mining Act, DEQ is required to issue the permit. So as I said earlier, another component of the application review is an environmental review. The Montana Environmental Poly Policy Act, or MEPA, requires the EU to identify, analyze, and disclose impacts that could result from the proposed project and determine the significance of those impacts. So the EQ looks at impacts to a number of resources, including air, water, wildlife, and vegetation. However, MEPA is procedural. That means that it doesn't grant DEQ any additional regulatory authority. Even if we identify impacts to the proposed from the proposed project, NEPA does not give DEQ the authority to mitigate those impacts. So NEPA doesn't allow us to deny a permit, uh, but it allows for and requires a disclosure of the impacts from that permit. So the environmental review is completed at the same time that a permit is issued. The third major component of this process is public participation, which is largely defined by public comment. DEQ collects and reviews written public comments throughout the entire permitting process. 
including tonight, and we've heard from many of you leading up to tonight. Uh, written comments give us time to adequately review and understand the concerns of the public. So we are looking for substantive comments, which are comments that provide new or additional information relevant to the permit or environmental analysis. While substantive comments help DEQ understand the site and surrounding area, it is important to understand that the permitting process is not decided by a vote for or against the project. If the application meets the requirements of the Open Cup Mining Act, DEQ must issue the permit. So comments, again, can be submitted on, in writing via paper mail or email uh, or in the box labeled, I guess you forgot to label on there, but that gray box back there that um, will hold all your comments if you take them back. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Ann to talk about the specifics of the return Thank you. So I'm going to go over a little bit more of the specific application details. Um, I thought I'd zoom way out and look at the geologic setting. So the site is located within the Gallatin Valley and Chamonte Basin, which is essentially a wide valley between mountain um, ranges. We're situated between the Gallatin Range, the Bridge Range, and the Tobacco River Mountains. Uh, so this was formed about 17 million years ago for basin range extension. Um, after that occurred, there was an initial sediment deposit, which was later overlaid by alluvial sediments. Um, at this particular site, it's an alluvial fan. Um, so this is the material that will be mined, or is proposed to be mined. Um, and alluvial sediments are just positive on a river screen. The aquifer um, in this area is unconfined, meaning that the water table can rise and fall. Um, and groundwater generally moves north from the Gallatin Range to Belgrade, Manhattan, and Lincoln. So I'll zoom in a little bit further to the location map, which is provided in the application. So the application, or this, the proposed site is located approximately one mile south of Gallatin Gateway, which is about a mile south of where we're sitting today. Um, the Gallatin River is located approximately 2,500 feet to the west of the western proposed permit boundary, um, and it's roughly 50 feet lower in elevation than the um, permit boundary. So, looking at the site map that was also included in the application, um, the proposed site boundary is composed of 129.9 acres. The 70.9 acres to the south. Is the bonded and the northern 59 acres is designated as non bonded. So an operator cannot conduct any open cut operations in a non bonded area until this request uh, modified bonded acreage is met, but then we've been approved by DEQ. So as the application stands currently, they will begin operations in the southern portion of the boundary. Um, the proposed equipment includes a crusher and does not include a concrete or asphalt plant. So just the pressure on screen. Um, the application indicates um, that. Okay. Yep. Can you hear? Okay. Sorry. I'm not used to this. Um, so I'll repeat a little bit of what I just said. Um, so, as I said, the southern portion of the, the boundary is uh, going to be bonded, and the northern portion is currently not bonded. Um, an operator cannot conduct any open cut operations in a non bonded area until the modified bonded acreage is submitted and approved by DQ. So, as the application stands currently, they would begin operations in the southern portion of the boundary. Um, proposed equipment on site is a crusher. Um, they will not have an asphalt or concrete plant, um, just a crusher on site. Um, and the application indicates that the crusher will be located um, closer to 191 um, and away from other uh, residences so as to mitigate noise. Um, no, uh, TMC Inc. has stated that they will maintain a 10 foot buffer for groundwater. Sorry, um, which would mean that their excavation will stay 10 feet vertically from the water table. 
So this overall was a general overview of the application of the entire standard application, including the proposed site map, can be viewed on the DEQ open uh, cut section website, um, as well as we have some copies left um, in the back corner of the room uh, on paper. Um, you can also, on the public comment forms, there's a QR code that you're able to scan and it will give you uh, a slide. Um, which would allow you to view it on our website. So the site was inspected in October of 2022, as well as June of 2023 by the uh, department. It was flown the UAV, which is essentially a drone. Uh, so it was flown with the drone to obtain current aerial imagery. Um, I thought that the image was important to include because it's not necessarily viewable from the road, but the site actually sits on the edge of a bench, and there's approximately a 38 foot difference between um, the top and the bottom of the bench. Um, so for other regulatory requirements, um, if an open cut mining permit is approved, the operator is still under the obligation to comply with any uh, obligated to comply with any other applicable federal, state, county, or local laws or regulations, and obtain any other permits, licenses, or approvals. I don't think that works. Hello. No. There's batteries over there on the table. Put that up. Give us, give us a few minutes here. We're seeing if you have any technical difficulties. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit. Um, so there are other regulatory, generally other regulatory requirements uh, for um, an open cut mining permit. Uh, the operator is still under the obligation to comply with any other applicable federal, state, county, or local laws or regulation and obtain any other permits, licenses, or approvals required for any part of the operation. So this can include county zoning, an approach permit, a water right, air registration, et cetera. So the subsequent process, if a permit is approved, 
Um, and if a citizen observes activities that they believe violate the permit, they can file a complaint with the DEQ enforcement division. The phone number is located there um, as well as on the website. Uh, DEQ investigates each complaint and it determines if the operator has violated its permit. DEQ can take enforcement action to correct the problem. Um, the department will also regularly conduct inspections as it does on each of its sites. Um, to ensure that the operator uh, is abiding by the requirements out of the permit. And generally, for, for, for all open cut permits, um, the end result is reclamation. The above image is an example of a release site in uh, Petroleum County. So, this application specifies a December 2043 reclamation date. The post mining land use selected by the operator is after Angel Rangeland. So the site must be sloped to a ratio of three to one or higher, so essentially a 33% slope. It must be seeded and have had at least two years of well-established vegetation growth before the department will release the site and terminate the permit. The department also holds the bond to ensure that reclamation is complete um, and only releases it once the site is released. And again, we just want to remind you that we will be accepting written public comments throughout the meeting, uh, which is uh, you can fill out the forums located next to the gray box, um, insert into the lock box. Uh, public comments are accepted throughout the entire permitting process. So before the meeting, after the meeting, um, and until the permit is approved. So now we will move on to some frequently asked questions. Uh, we read each and every public comment that comes in, and uh, we kind of culminated some of the FAQs from those public comments, and um, we'll sort of direct them to the, the correct parties. So the first question is, does the site require a permit or registration through the EQ Air Quality? So I'll pass it over to Troy Burroughs at the EQ Air Quality Specialist. Thank you, Ann. Yeah, we do not have a permitting process for portable sites, which we define as pressure and strains. Concrete batch pipes and asphalt pipes. We do have a registration process. And what we did is we took all of what was in the permit for requirements and put it into the administrative rules of Montana. And that way, all of these guys are regulated the same, and that allows us to enforce the same throughout the state. And it makes it easier for them and for us to manage the sites for air quality. <laughs> Oh, and you know, the registration requires them to notify us 15 days prior to operating on any new site or anywhere they move to. Those notifications get posted on the DEQ website on a GIS map, and you can actually go look at those in the public. You can click on the little dot on that site, and it will bring up their, their actual registration paperwork. So you can see when they register, what they register, and their estimated dates of operation on that site. And that is valid for any crusher, any screen, block plant, asphalt plant, or concrete battery. Okay, so we're going to try. So the second question is Does the site require a permit through the EQ water quality? Uh, we don't have an EQ water quality number here today, uh, but they uh, provided some information for me to pass along. Um, they wanted me to let you know that any sand and gravel mining facility that has potential to discharge industrial stormwater to state waters is required to apply for the Montana Stormwater Industrial Permit, which is the MSGP. Um, it will be up to DEQ water quality to determine if this permit is needed for the site. Um, this permit would require water monitoring and sampling during stormwater events, and they would be sampling specifically for nitrate and nitrite, as well as TFF or total suspended solids. The next question is, will the proposed open cut operation affect nutrients in the Galaxy River? And we'll pass that on to Susan Batten, she is uh, the DEQ Water Quality Center Supervisor, she is joining via Zoom. Hi, everyone. I'm Christina Staten, um, representing the Gallatin Algae Project team this evening to answer this question and any other questions you have about the algae sampling on the Gallatin River. 
But the answer to this question is uh, no. We think this will have very minimal impact. Christina, we're not hearing you. Can you pause for just one moment? Yes. Christina, can you try again, please? Yes, can you hear me okay hear now? Me. Yes, for some reason you're not coming through that. That again. Can you try it again? Can you hear me okay now? It's a little bit tough to hear you. Maybe um Maybe we can repeat it. Okay. Okay. Awesome. How about you just type it into the chat and we will go ahead and read it out. Does that work? Yes. Okay. Christine, if you go ahead and type it into the chat and read it out, we'll go to the next one and come back to it. And now, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so going on to the next question. If I have concerns about water quality or quantity, who should I contact? So for water quality, um, you can go on to the DEP report solution page and report any concerns that you have about water quality. And for water quantity, that would be a PNRC file you have to someone. Yeah, so if you have concerns about quantity, give us a call and we can give you some information on what we know and the resources that we have. Um, one thing I like to suggest for people who have change coming to their neighborhood is maybe to get some data on water. And Timmy this to me as an expert in collecting water data to expand it. So I'll let him ask some questions. That's fine. Thanks, Gary. Um, so you may have a uh, drinking water well in your backyard, and as Carrie mentioned, it's great to get um, some background information on what that, the chemical makeup of that, and what that water looks like. So in Montana, there's uh, a variety of uh, testing facilities that you can submit a water sample to, and they will tell you about the chemical composition of that water. Uh, there's a local facility actually right in Four Corners, uh, on the corner of Popeye and Jackrabbit. Uh, there's lab throughout the state for the fillings, and there's a state lab at the Department of uh, Public Health and Human Services. So, um, if you are concerned about what this may be doing to your own drinking water, I would definitely encourage you to contact me at the Water Quality District. And I can help you pick out um, a basic list of animals that you could sample for, and you could compare your results. Uh, you could you could collect those over a course of several years, uh, maybe a summertime or wintertime sample, uh, and just keep keep an eye on that water. Uh, I will say that. You know we, we do have some monitored wells in our water quality district that characterize both quantity and quality. And the water, just, just for reference, we have a couple of wells at the current board in pit, right? So um, we don't have a lot of historical data on that, but the water that's in those monitoring wells at the pit, uh, at, at that gravel pit, looks like typical gallatin gravel water. Um, <laughs> Something I said. So um, we have some great resources at our water quality district where you can keep tabs on that water uh, by coming in and picking up well testing kits, and we can walk you through how to interpret those data and how those data compare to average conditions around the Gallatin Valley. So we've got 60 some monitoring wells from which we can compare the chemical makeup of the water in your well uh, 
to what typical groundwater in the Valley looks like. Question. So, is there a testing well or a well that's going to be, you know, at our properties where this is going to be neighboring? Um, I'm a little unclear. Are you asking whether there's going to be a wet monitoring well at the facility? Um, you know, bordering the properties that their company would work. I don't know the answer to that. Um, we have some pre existing monitoring wells in the valley that are sort of near this area. Um, but you know, these are costly wells to install, uh, or, or more monitoring wells are costly. And really, domestic wells uh, do just as good a job of characterizing groundwater as a monitoring well would. So, again, the emphasis on testing your well once a year uh, at a minimum for some of these fundamental, fundamental to solve uh, constituents that are in a groundwater here to help. Since you have to run for the property of this, um, I would do it like once a month, and I would start it before, like way before. Is that going to be at my expense or our expense? Due to the wells being privately owned by the homeowners, yes, it would be. I, I, I would say that once a month, um, that you know, we typically monitor these wells uh, for changes in the water level quarterly basis. Um, a lot of the monitoring that we've done in the past has been every five years. The, the, the gist of it, the gist of it is of that is that groundwater in this valley is fairly uniform in its chemical composition throughout time. Um, and I don't know of any kinds of But then you throw a money thing in and it's going to all be different. Well there's there's a possibility of that. Yeah. Um, I mean obviously that that's a good would be at our expense to monitor what their properties doing to our looking for, right? We can go just together. Well, we have that tonight. Well, I just have to work to you. I do board the property we're going in. I'm doing it. We may have their elderly, and we have health conditions, and it's just Yeah. We'll help clear up some of this. So, again, I'm Marty Gagnon with Morrison Barley. If you're out of the picture, you not be finding. Sorry. Can you hear me? I'm Marty Gagnon with Morrison Barley. The gravel pit will not be mined in the groundwater. The groundwater will not be affected by the by the gravel plane at all. Because they're not going to mine into the ground. So they're going to stay 10 feet above the groundwater level. So there's 10 feet of separation from the, the gravel pit floor to the groundwater. That's 10 feet above the high groundwater level. They're going to stay 10 feet above the historical high groundwater level. And it's pretty consistent. Groundwater doesn't fluctuate that much from a year to year basis. We, we have hydraulics. Historically, ground pit do not affect groundwater quality. Okay, everybody, just needs to quiet down. We have a number of FAQs to get through. We already have some questions online. We want to make sure we're hearing from everyone. So we'll go through the rest of the questions, and then we're going to open it up for general Q and A. So let's just go through the next, and then we will we will answer your question. Can, can you please address the 2018 lawsuit against CMC? Get a nice Sir, please finally go through the rest of the questions. If you please be quiet, and then we can move, and we'll answer all of your questions. I promise. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that promise.
So the next question that we have, uh, the next the next question is what impact might this proposed site have on local health hurts? So I'll pass this off to FWP or Hansen. I think you know, it's a good question. Uh, we've got uh, three different health uh, management boundaries uh, to this site. Uh, the elk curve that overlaps the site, uh, Gallup Gateway curve, uh, this winter was counted at just over uh, a thousand individuals. And this site um, is known uh, winter habitat for elk. And uh, all we can tell you uh, about. That, that it will be a loss of about 130 acres of winter habitat for uh, for the center. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Did the bird and bird first start in 2005? When we first counted it in 2005, it was 200 elk. <laughs> How many buildings between the economy of the money and the this one? Uh, Big Wall Life Party doesn't collect that data. Like, yeah. But we this place, which we're going to, I would tell you that there will be easy to find between the money and the bridge and the gas station. This one. What, what's the plan to deal with that? We don't speculate toward what might happen. We don't have to do what we have to do. Sorry, I can't hear you. I'm going to be asking. Well, I'm going to be asking. I'm going to be number of them. But I'd be happy to find that out and get back to you if you want to track me down afterwards. It is really hard to hear on the page all the individual questions. So if you could see the folder questions, we have like two more FAQs and then we'll take it by hand so that we all hear the questions and make sure we're getting to them. Um, I know for you, we want to have a question, but I fully understand that it's really hard for us to hear up here with questions being asked. So um, we'll go to the next question and then we'll move to open questions. Oh, and another frequently asked question is, you know, I have concerns about US Highway 191. What is MDT's involvement with this project? So with MDT. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So again, Dave Bates and Penny from our district pre construction engineer. Um, I'll start off by what our involvement is with respect to this proposed development. MDT is responsible for evaluating encroachments that are proposed to access any of our federal aid or state jobs in Montana. So that evaluation uh, the, is congruent with the complexity of the proposed development in that uh, at the district level, if, if proposed encroachments are you know simple enough, we can handle them with our staff in the district. And then, of course, as complexity increases, we have a, a group at headquarters in Helena that helps facilitate matching uh, project or technical experts with the needs of the proposed action. So, in this case, this this proposal was submitted through our system impact planning action process in, in headquarters and uh, have been reviewed by. Our traffic and safety bureau, including uh, all of the other functional units that would have influence on uh, comments with respect to the, the proposed access. And so I'm just trying to step through all the high level things that it takes. And on a, on a project proposal like this, what we require is a traffic impact study. And from that traffic impact study, we, we then understand what the proposed operation is going to be with respect to. Um, you know, what, what, how they're going to use the site and what we can expect in terms of traffic generation and fuel damage. From that, we're able to objectively evaluate what um, traffic mitigation would be required or geometric mitigation required that is then the responsibility of developers to pay for that improvement on our system to ensure 
that the proposed development, what it's contributing to the system, operates um, with, with efficiently with respect to safety and operation. What about our cost? Yes. Um, folks, I know you're going to have a lot of questions for me about what we're doing with our projects and what we're going to be safety. Believe me, you know, it's our mission. Safety is our number one priority and it takes all of us. And I'm here to tell you there's not enough money in the world to address every one of these needs that are out here across our system statewide. And we need some continued outpace money available. And we're doing the best we can to be able to address project needs with, with projects that are meaningful to contribute to improved safety. Okay. And that expectation, you know, I don't think anybody is expecting. The Department of Transportation, the government, whoever, to make sure that we can drive as fast as we can wherever we want. Everybody wants to get home safe, right? And we want to be able to move people and freight and goods efficiently, right? And so slow down, pay attention, avoid distraction. That responsibility falls on everyone else. And I'm happy to discuss the projects that we have coming. One that I'm super excited about because I've heard from many of you, I'm sure there's some of you that have talked to me about uh, the mail label intersection, for example. Uh, we have a project that is currently working through the piece to get out with a consultant to help us for the design. It's uh, GNO and I's one of our main district priorities to get that project program and out for construction so that we can get a signal on here at mail and label. Um, if you notice between uh, Zachariah and Rouge, the utility companies out there moving the utilities. We're going to have construction next summer to extend that center two way left turn lane between Rouge and Zachariah. Um, we have a couple other bridge projects planned in the system. And, you know, again, like I said, it's self based funding available and we're doing the best we can as we want to. So, so my question is if there is some funding, so that there is some funding instead of the project, why would you keep the project if there's not money to get out there? You have to like the project. You do not. We have one microphone is working, and they can't hear online. So if you can ask one question at a time, we're going to have to repeat so people. So the question is, if there isn't enough money for these projects, then why do we keep approving projects? Right. Right. Well, what I'd like to say is that if there's yeah. We're responsible for ensuring the operation of our federal aid system. Okay, so the money that we are given from the federal government and the workers we're, we're charged with doing the best we can to preserve the system. And within that funding that's available, we have to be able to construct the right project at the right time. But there again, folks, um, I, I hear you loud and clear, and we can have lots of fun conversations about this. I'm, I'm telling you that the funding is a challenge for the state of Montana with respect to transportation and infrastructure. Talk to your local representative, your congressman, about the needs to fund infrastructure in Montana. But if there's a project that is funded, then why would we keep funding? Okay, listen, folks, I'm really passionate about this, and I hear you loud and clear. There is, when we, we have our programs are focused on this data driven. So, yeah. the decisions we make for projects, the flood projects, is based on data. And that, uh, safety is, is, is that. And that when there's an issue, we have lots of funding opportunities that we need to address those issues. So, does that data include 200 more semis a day on the highway? <laughs> Right. So again, like back to what I was saying earlier. Is it TMC going to Yeah. 
So they should be, be respectful to each other and have people one at a time. So everybody can hear. And we're going to have to repeat your questions. So when you ask them, we can hear you, but we'll need to repeat online. So I think we have any more questions to go through. We have two quick questions for FAQs, and then we can get into general questions. If you could please just hold your questions, we will have time to go through all of your questions. So the next question is, what will the hours of operation be? Um, so the Open Cut Mining Act no longer regulates hours of operation. There are no requirements within the Open Cut application to specify hours of operation. CMC Inc. will be left to make that determination. Um, I will leave that to Ken Murphy to uh, include some information. Okay. Yeah, we're right. Can you hear me now? All right, can everybody hear me? Okay, hours of operation, the biggest question I saw. We listened, we, we saw your request, we listened to your concerns. We are not going to operate 24 7. Hey. That is not, that was never. We have to apply for this, it's part of the process. Excuse me? Our hours of operation are going to be 6 a.m. to 5, 7 p.m. for trucking. We do that so that we can get out onto the highway before traffic. Our normal, <laughs> right? I, I get the joke. I live right down here at Gateway. I get out on this road every day. Um, excuse me. Yeah, I get out at probably five. You know, my day starts early and ends late. Um, our crushing operation will be seven to five. That's it. We'll do maintenance before and maintenance after. That's why the seven o'clock. Our normal, normal pit hours. Our scales are open six to five. Excuse me. They're not broken down, right? Our scales. Oh, your pressure. Your that doesn't matter. If they're broke down, they'll fix it. They will not run after five o'clock. Many days a week. Five days a week. Crushing. Saturday, strictly for maintenance and hauling. Seven to five. No work on Sundays. The reason we ask for 24 hours is all the same reason these guys are talking about our highway. Could you imagine if we tried to improve this highway out here during the daytime? Impossible. So what we're looking to do is we're gonna work with the DEQ to try to find some way to protect all of us that when this road construction does happen, hopefully they do it at night, that will be the closest source, the least amount of trucks to provide gravel for this road. There will be no asphalt. There will be no concrete in that pit ever. So, no, we're not. No, we don't. Okay, so we recycle concrete at our other pits, clean concrete. We don't take concrete with bar, but we do not mix or pour any concrete. PMC does not do that. Um, question Does the permit have a limitation on noise? I'm hoping it does. Who monitors the noise coming out of these outbreaks? Downing workings is what limits the noise um, and that work hours. The question was, is there a limit for noise at this pit? And in the DEQ, there is not. There is a county ordinance which dictates work hours. EMC mitigates noise by berming, by different types of backup alarms, so you don't hear them five miles away. We do different types of screens in our crushers. We tried some rubber screens to try to quiet them down. 
But during workout, during workout, whatever the county ordinance may be, there's nothing from DEQ. Burning? What did you mean by burning? What are you burning? I didn't say burn. Burning. Oh, burning. Okay. We'll put we'll put a twelve to fifteen foot burn all around our work area and around the pit. Outside that burn, around the pit, there will be trees. We'll water the trees. The trees will grow. There will be grass growing on the burns. Um, we found that to be a very effective way to manage noise. Excuse me. Oh yes. Yep. 12 to 15 feet. Yep. Are there any more FAQs? Do you have any that are like light? With no crushing at night, there will be virtually no light impact. It's not like we're going to have stadium lighting in there. That, that will not be the case. When and if we do use lighting, we use those portable crank up light plants and we point the lights down at the ground, probably no more than 20 feet off the ground. You guys, I'll say this, I'll wait for your response, but we try to be good neighbors. We live here. The Harrisons, the, 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 there's a whole group of my people here that live, born and raised in Gallatin Gateway. We care about what we're doing. Oh, the moment you've all been waiting for our official question and answer period. So you can go to the next slide, please. Yep, we are going to do that. That is correct. So just a reminder, if you would like to submit comments, there is a comment box at the back um, in that great submit written comments. You can also submit to the if you open that or mail to. And that has also been put in the chat online. And thank you to all of our online participants. We have about 50 of you who've been very patient um, and not been able to hear the audience. So we're going to make sure during this question and answer period that the online participants can hear. So if you'll go to the next slide, please. You can um, fill out a question form that we'll have here from Carly. If you'd like to actually just write your question, if you would like to ask a question, we're gonna ask that you raise your hand and we are going to run someone to you so that somebody online can hear you on the microphone and then we will answer it. So we just wanna make sure everyone can hear the questions. Everyone gets a chance to ask a question. Everyone can hear each other and be kind and respectful. And then we'll also make sure everybody online can hear. So we're just trying to make sure everybody can speak one at a time. And then for those online, um, see if I can hit this. That's perfect. Yeah, so for those online, please type your questions into the Q&A box. I know we have a number already. So we're going to take a few in the room, go to a few questions online, then go back to a few in the room. So if you're online, please uh, submit your question to that Q&A box. You'll see at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A uh, feature and you can just hit that and type your question in. And we are gonna, again, go for a few questions in the room and then a few online. And if calling by phone, I will give you a prompt. So first I'm gonna go ahead and go back to the water quality question and then we'll go ahead and start the general question. Okay. Okay, so there was a question on uh, in our FAQs on the Galaxian River, and we couldn't hear Christina very well in the room. So I'm going to go ahead and read off her answer here. I know those online were able to hear her, but those in the room were not. Okay, so we inspect the site, uh, the open site around the pit site, has very minimal impact to the Gallatin River in terms of nutrients. So that's what um, that's what Christina was stating earlier when we could hear her. And so from there, we are going to go to questions in the room. So we'll do two questions and then two questions online. And then I hand it over to Tanya to help you run that site. Uh, we need some statements. If you want to give them an opportunity, if they have questions, but they don't get to the opportunity to ask the question first, 
You can stand up and talk if you want to go first, or I'll just start moving forward. Okay. Yes, after talking through this process with our staff, none of the three of us have been through this before. We're all relatively new. I'm, my name is Zach Brown, and I work for you in the Geology and Education Center. And I would just generally implore everyone to treat these public officials with respect. Um, they drove all the way here and are answering our questions, and the tenor of this room is not particularly kind, frankly. So I would just implore our better angels to treat everyone with respect. Um, our question after discussing with staff is there any uh, any room in the permitting process for DEQ to consider operational uh, mitigation opportunities in terms of hours of operation, traffic, that sort of thing, or is the permitting process primarily concerned with reclamation? And then we also had a question about whether there is. Uh, Going to be an environmental EIS process at all, in which case, is there another public comment opportunity? So, we'll thank you, Commissioner. And I will turn that over to Anne. Yeah, so, um, what can, what's included and what we require to be included in the open pet permit um, is only what is required within the Open Pet Mining Act. Um, and TMC would like to impose uh, specific mitigations on their own site. They are able to include that in the permit, um, but it is not required in the Open Cut Mining Act. Um, we are also conducting an environmental review threat process, um, which uh, comes in the form of an environmental assessment, um, which is, is similar to an EIS, um, but not, not exactly. Um, Whitney, I don't know if you want to speak on the difference between the EA, the EIS. So an environmental assessment covers all of the same resources and looks at impacts to the same resources that an EIS would. Um, the timelines for that are required by law for us to turn around and respond to what the applicant submits don't allow time for an EIS. So we that's why we started at the beginning and do the environmental review through the entire process. So then we will be doing the EIS, it will be an EA. Great, thank you. I'm gonna read for the online. So I'm gonna do a couple more here in terms of the official Senator Flowers. Thank you, Sonia. Thanks uh, for the department for being here and questions for uh live. Yeah, sorry. Uh, thanks to the department for being here and answering the questions back in their lives, and they deserve an answer. So, first question I have is: Have you, the department, ever denied a permit under the current version of the Open Cut Mining Act? And if so, um, under what circumstances? In terms of uh, denying a permit, the process, as was outlined, you go through a deficiency process. Uh, the applicant has opportunity to meet uh, the, the, the requirements of the law. And so we will issue a deficiency and say, you didn't make this mark, you missed this mark, you missed this mark. And then it's up to them to respond and meet that. And so we have had instances, I can't speak to some of the past of the past of 599, whether that's occurred before or after, where people simply have uh, permits that simply never gone forward because they never made it through that deficiency process. They, they simply are in an endless round of deficiency and ultimately aren't offered their uh, aren't granted a permit because they don't need the requirements of the law. We knew what you had to do that. That pretty much covers it. But in the end, they either meet the requirements of the Open Cup Mining Act or they don't. Uh, once we issue a deficiency letter, an operator or an applicant has one year to respond to us. If they don't respond within that year, the, the application essentially goes away and they will have to start over if they wanted to again. So, Sonia, I just have one other question. Okay. Typically, in environmental review, you're looking at economic impacts as well as environmental impacts. And clearly, I know some, some landowners feel like it's going to have a direct impact on the value of their property. 
at what level of diminution of value of adjacent properties does that become a significant impact that warrants the uh, initiation of environmental impact statement? Thank you. And uh, I don't know if Whitney or Anna want to add in on this one or not, but essentially, when we take a look at that and the, the economic impact. Really, we are granted authority to look at the diminution or potential diminution of property values um, in terms of, of impacts. And I would ask if, if Whitney or Ann have anything in, in addition to that. So we look at it in the environmental review and we welcome any extra information anyone can provide in a public comment that would help inform that analysis. And again, I should clarify, I'm speaking to the application permitting process in the environmental review process. Again, that is this is the opportunity, and that is where we hit that's why we have the comments. So that can be incorporated into our environmental analysis conducted under the Montana Environmental Policy Act. But as Wendy pointed out, the Montana Environmental Policy Act is procedural in nature. It doesn't grant us additional authority, for example, to deny a permit. Because it, it demonstrates a diminution of property value. That is that falls under the NEPA analysis, which is procedural and informative in nature, not substantive. Our ability to grant or deny a permit is in the open plan Act. But why do the environmental study of the release not so the question is why do an environmental study if it doesn't impact it? It does impact, it discloses information, it provides information. It makes us take a deeper look at where our authority is and where we can we can hope. It also provides additional information to the applicant to take a look at that and respond. Well, it doesn't grant us, I said, specific authority to grant or not issue. It grants us the authority to share information. And that is that is the goal of FIFA, is it's that public participation information share. Anything else? All right, I'm going to take one more audience question and I'm going to take two online. First, we have a question. Our question is probably and we'll get to those if you don't want to So, why is it so important to expedite the environmental impact by doing the EA versus an EIS? So we covered this one a little bit earlier. Um, essentially, the timelines that are required at DEQ to respond to the applicant don't allow for enough time for us to do an EIS. So we do an environmental review, but it is an environmental enough. Or it's not, sorry, environmental is I'm going to turn it over to Moira for an online question. Thank you. Yeah, we have a number of online questions. I'll just take two of them at this time, and then we'll go back to the room. The first one asks why are residents tasked with monitoring water quality and impacts on their property? I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. Um, other than that, um, as well as homeowners, as well owners, it's your responsibility to task for all levels. That's um, I would work with private domestic drinking water wells in the state of Montana. Um, so if you want your well tested, then you know we could advise you on what to test for and help you interpret your results. But as owners of that well, it is your responsibility to test for the water in that well. Uh, the question was what did that what does that cost? Um, it depends on what you want to analyze. Um, from my knowledge, I think that you could cover a basic suite of uh, analytes like uh, trace elements, uh, common, commonly found in drinking water uh, analysis for human consumption, for irrigation, or for stock. Uh, maybe 50 bucks to 75 bucks you get on per test. It's 250. I would also add that there is no requirement in the Legal Good Pet Mining Act. So that is why we are, um, if you would like testing them on your own private wells, that there would be incurred costs on your own uh, because there's no, no uh, statutory requirement for that. All right, I'm going to read one more question and then I'm going to take one uh, from the room. So, uh, 
Uh, thank you, TNC, for the operating restrictions you are incorporating already. I appreciate them and your good neighbor attitude. Uh, our groundwater, we live three quarters of a mile south. Uh, water at, at a, a 40 inch mining depth is in our groundwater. What protections are available for groundwater quantity protections? Okay. <laughs> Um, here, let me get this from my. We live three quarters of a mile south, and we have water at 30 feet from under your own home. So, wondering what sort of, and other people in our subdivision may be good too. So, wondering what groundwater protections are available to ensure our world don't get compromised, that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah, I'll start. Um, I mean, that, that's a great question. It, it has a lot of different directions I can take it. I'll start the big picture of it. You know, I mean, they can respond like what they've monitored, I'm assuming, that people where the mine is at. So. That is good, and they don't want to go below that. The NRC um, allows people to mine below the groundwater table. That's not a bench, it leaves the water, and the water table is not a bench, it leaves the water. So it's that you can see that the new intersect groundwater, and that doesn't need a water, right? and that's not something that we permit. It's allowed for access to that new one. As far as your water is, so you want to make sure you have your water in some place for your wells. And why I mentioned the monitoring, if you see an effect to your well, that is something you can put your basement through the courts. We don't have a permit in front of us, so there won't be any analysis that we can do on the land. We can our jurisdiction is if there is any uh, permit or any sort of illegal use of water in front of you, which. I'm assuming there won't be. So that's it. That's right. So the question was how we're going to affect your well, three quarters of a mile south, and your, and your uh, water quantity. Yeah, so, so the, the groundwater gradient is a slope. So it's sloping from your place to the north. And the ground elevation is slopes at a different slope than the groundwater. So it's getting deeper as it comes to this site. So that's why we can mine deeper at this site than we could at your site. Groundwater levels aren't the same at different locations. And again, the plan is to stay 10 feet above the groundwater level. So we won't be affecting the groundwater at all. It is the groundwater level that you're mining. It it varies across the site. Question. What the question was? What is the groundwater level at our site? It varies across the site because the ground does slope across the site, but it's about fifty feet deeper on one side, shallower on the other. About fifty. Feet. Um, I'm, listening, I'm listening to the left side of the page and the right side of the page, but I'm trying to really think I don't even know what you all are looking for. Is that there is something philosophically extremely wrong with me? No one has said anything about the gateway, you know, the park. Nobody has said anything about why. Come to the don't ever seem to say no. <laughs> I grew up in the canyon, I saw big red, big stuff. Yeah, I had to do something right to I 
Yeah, we are having trouble getting to hear on the yet. Um, what systems are processes are in place to ensure that the operator does not hit the water table and does not affect water quality? Yeah, you want to take that? So we regularly conduct open cut inspections. We do uh, boots on the ground site visits. Um, so if there are any violations that are witnessed while on site, um, we immediately issue a violation letter. Um, and we go through that process to um, evaluate uh, the impacts of the violation and how to resolve them. Um, we also rely on individuals if they see a violation that they can uh, report said violation and it will be investigated by DQ. I don't know if TMC wants to uh, address how you'd like to um, how you're going to continue to uh, separate and maintain a 10 foot buffer. Yeah, water, the way we know what the buffer is is by looking at well locks. We've looked at all the well locks on black property, well locks to the south. That's all public information. We can all look at it. And with that, we know what the groundwater is doing. Should the USDS uh, groundwater contour to come across this valley? This entire valley, the water goes across at its flow. Uh, it's hard to believe, but it comes in a wave and it moves across. Our we've, we've worked in the water in this valley many times. Um, some way to try to ensure you that you're not going to have problems. We dug a gateway pit for 15 years in the water that went directly to the Gallatin River. Never did we have a violation. So, just that the head runs through there. Yeah. Well, that. We have folks online, so let's keep our questions. So just to repeat that, for the benefit of the folks online, you asked if that was the headwaters for the for Trout Creek. And this we just wanted to get. So we take two more questions here. How much is the reclamation bond? Uh, I have it available in the open cut permit. There is actually a reclamation bond spreadsheet included on the exact amount as soon as it gets to the page. So the reclamation bond for the bonded area, which is the 70.9 acres, is $899,278. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question about the environmental review and the showing the part right here. So be ready. Uh, <laughs> less than three weeks ago, those of us who reside within a mile of a proposed gravel site were notified by an organization by mail that we have a new birds, magnificent elk herds, and mule deer herds in this immediate area, this immediate area of the gravel area. And we were admonished not to create any unwanted noises which disturbed these elk herds. And I wanted to interview with what detail study have you performed or anyone has tried that in state that these activities of this elder are uh, the activities of the gravel pit are not going to disturb the great noise or any of the problem with this magnificent elder that you bring in. Thank you for the question. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the mailer. That came from the Department of Fish and Wildlife and Parks. Yeah, we got it on June 30th. Montana Fish and Wildlife Parks notice no harassment of wildlife allowed. We are magnificent elk herds and we will be able to give a solution to this in our subdivision throughout the year. 
you may not be aware of they have on the scope of getting data. And fireworks, loud noises are a lasting why? 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 Which is uh, against state law. Uh, there's defined within that state law what is harassment of wildlife. And uh, the department uh, did comment on uh, this proposal, noting that it would be the elimination of uh, the proposed acreage of a mineral habitat um, for Port Ellis specifically. So where do we find that site? I mean, there's no doubt that yeah. the dust and white air contaminants and collisions on the highways from the impact of the travel pit that are going to not decimate, but certainly affect the number of cattle that they often hear. So how does that detail environment study that you can find online or you can tell how no, sir, we have not done any study um, specific to this shelter in this region. Um, in regards to uh, any time I'm serving the students. So it should be done with food. Not directly related to this proposal, uh, the department is proposing a study of this shelter. Well, related to the study, it should be done. This operation is going to materially affect the well being of the shelter in the Utah activity and the activities of birds. It should be tested and for all the public and for the animals themselves. It should be done in conjunction with this project. Uh, the question in summary is because of this proposal, should this study be done? But because of their recognition, this is an innocent Their words. This is all of our magnificent. Actually, it's a magnificent. And, and our proposed study may inform uh, some of the questions that you're having. I'm going to turn the mic over to Commissioner Brown. And again, please remind everyone to be respectful of, of everyone in the meeting. Well, uh, uh, Commissioner Boyer, you can do somewhere. He's been advocating uh, with our biologists uh, in Region 3, Julie Cunningham, to advance a study uh, in this area to analyze uh, impact. And general uh, migration patterns and behavior of the elk herd. It's on full time from 191. We presented that to us a couple of weeks ago. We submitted a letter of support this week. And that study, which was, has much broader context than this particular discussion about this particular graph of density, but it's generally trying to understand the dynamics of that elk herd and just research, baseline research about that elk herd, is under consideration by like this lot of the parks. And the biologists in this region, as well as the county commission, and many advocacy groups in this uh, county are advocating for that study internally by FWD. So that answers that question. I think relevant information. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go to the back again here, where somebody has been for a long time. Can you hear me? Sorry. My name is Kim Wilson. I'm here tonight representing the Gateway Conservation Alliance, a large group of uh, local and regional folks who are concerned about environmental issues in this area. The first one I'll make is actually that we reject the fact that we do not take any formal public comment at this meeting. I understand, however, you are taking questions. I would point out that we have submitted today detailed comments in writing, both from myself, um, lots of the members have already submitted comments, as well as our hydrologist, David Donahue, who is also here today. He will have a few questions as well. My question, my two questions are this What will each you do to verify the correctness and sufficiency of all the information? That the applicant certified as proven the application 
in order to comply with your duties under 824.22, which is to independently verify the information in the application. And the related question I have is what additional measures will we, you take to ensure that the inaccurate information that we've highlighted in the assembly application is corrected before this moves forward? Thank you. So again, we, we welcome comments that help us better understand the site and the area. I think one, one thing I can speak to right now is uh, there's been a lot of comments about depth to groundwater. We have a worksheet called the depth, depth to groundwater worksheet, which will probably go out as part of the deficiency letter to make sure that that information is correct in the permit. Um, what was the second part of your question? Sorry. What additional measures would we take to ensure that the inaccurate information is correct? Thank you. Uh, we will review the materials to ensure that they either meet the requirements of the Open Cup Mining Act or those questions get into a dependency letter so that we can get more information about it. And again, we appreciate the public comments, written comments in the box, please. And we accept public comments throughout the process. And we have email, written comments. And so please provide those. What a new day. Due date of all comments is, is dependent upon the permit. Uh, you know, as we said, it's throughout the permitting process. We've already indicated a deficiency letter will come out likely August 9th. So it, it, at least then uh, the DP applicant will have an opportunity to respond to those deficiencies. We'll have an opportunity to respond to their response. And throughout that entire process, again, we continue to accept public comments. Um, I'm going to hop online now and take one minute. But the may have been answered a little bit, but what do you believe to ensure uh, that people do things and try to keep up? And then, I think we did answer that. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna move on since we got so many. So the next one I have is Will the hours of operation be specified in the permit if volunteered to by EMC? So we let AMC answer that. Repeat the question, please. To clarify, will the hours of operation be specified in your permit? Yes, as I spoke, when we get our deficiency letter in August, we will amend our hours of operation and that will be on public record in the permit. Thank you. All right, show of hands. Go ahead. I just saw that this is a comment. I can see the question. Just really quickly, I think it's important to say we all came here and have an attitude of respect. Clearly, the open pit um, legal process is undemocratic in a profound way. And I think people are learning that. So, to come to a process where you hope you might have a little bit of power to learn that you have none. I commend everybody for being respectful in this meeting. It's hard to learn. You have no power. Now I think we have a big job ahead of us to work on that legislation, which makes it entirely in the laps of industry to do exactly what they want. And neighbors are disempowered. The whole community is disempowered. Yeah. That's not good. People who haven't asked the question yet, I'd like to state that, in my opinion, many of your answers run closer to opinions than factual, verified, scientifically fact. And I'm just interested in knowing. Whether or not you are prepared to make those same statements in court. <laughs> Whether you think what you have said here today would stand up under scrutiny. Good. The opposition is 
Information we are providing is accurate and, and under oath, we will put you know the truth and it will be accurate and speak to our authority and our ability to determine and engage. Hi there, very good time to bring in the TNC and then Donna. The, uh, the strip for Donna will stand up. The strip for Donna near the mid sky. Is the fifth most dangerous road in Montana. In the last two years, there were 203 accidents, 76 non fatal injuries. Some people call it the gauntlet of the death. There are 23 flight crosses and three more in the last 90 days. Yep. What is MDOT? What is TMC going to do? Is this bill will create 400,000 round trips of your trucks, 400,000 round trips of your trucks. The big sky where the people who live and benefit are in Madison County. They aren't even Gallatin County for the most part. What's the mitigation going to be to keep us folks safe and the tourists and your life safe? Later. All right. Safety is our number one priority for our, our folks at workforce and for anyone else on the road. We've got 25 drivers that drive this road every day. They've seen it all. Um, what we're doing to mitigate safety, we applied for our approach permit. We designed an approach that somewhat exceeded the requirements of DOT. The number of trucks, this is actually going to put less trucks on the road. I don't know numbers, but think of it this way. Think of it this way. If you don't have a pit here, that demand in Big Sky is not going to change. So if that material has to come from Livingston, Three Forks, whatever, the number eight the maps. Excuse me? Jack Creek from Madison Town. Okay, have you driven Jack Creek? So safety is our is our concern. Okay. Uh, so, so the way we help identify our short and long short and long term needs on our systems is through studies, corridor studies specifically. A corridor study was completed on 191, four corners of the river in 2020. Um, that study outlines needs that uh, are pretty challenging with respect to current and anticipated funding levels to be able to address all those things within you know, a reasonable planning time. So that said, what we did is something completely different that the department has not done on any of our other data collection studies. And we've initiated uh, what we're calling a feasibility study on the corridor study. And what that's aimed to do is help us look at the systemic issues on the route to help us identify where the loading need food is to address some of those project needs with you know uh, meaningful improvements that contribute that will contribute to enhanced operation and safety. Okay. So that's one of the things that's happening right now. We hired a consultant that has done this type of work on a similar route in uh, Colorado. And we are working with a variety of stakeholders, including folks in Big Sky, um, Gallatin County, um, uh, local, other local officials, uh, and, and stakeholders. So I'm sure some of you will have screw up in that process. One comment. I did two subdivisions with Marty. I made it to down the street two subdivisions. The developer, TMC or Black, somebody else ought to pay for it. Um, we are not so, so that's a great point, Nathan. Um, I, I just I'll, I'll understand a little bit further on the geometric proposed and the comment was made that this meets or exceeds current design standards for for our route. And I think I think that's important that for all you to know the TMC the developers and we require developers to pay for that mitigation. So this the, the proposed approach that we that they're they're talking about isn't just simply the approach 
As you can see from the geometric they put over here, the current anticipated configuration is going to be a northbound and southbound left turn that, that achieve design standard, current design standards for the operation of the device. And, and to your point, sir, um, we're working closely with Gallatin County, Madison County. Um, there's been a lot of lessons learned over the years with responding to this road, right? And we do lean on each other to be able to help project where the needs are coming and 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 harness what we can from those from those developments and industry development to to build our transportation system. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and take another online question. And thank you to everyone online who shared with us because I know it's kind of hard to hear. Um, I'm going to just ask two of the questions. I think the first one is a pretty simple answer and probably for our team. So the first is Can any environmental impact studies that have been completed be shared? Um, so I think the team can answer that. And the second question is What's being done uh, for aesthetics? On, on the sites to um, make it more pleasing for the neighbors. Right. So first on what uh, EIS or uh, VA document and information that prepared can be shared. Um, I can speak a little bit to that. We're welcome to share any of the EAs we have prepared for some of uh, the other open cut sites. Uh, this isn't the first controversial site in Canada. And so I can turn to share some of those past environmental assessments that have been prepared um, if, if anyone would like to take a look. And then again, as we do this, a draft EA will go out. Um, and I think Whitney can go through the process in terms of when the EA comes out and gets approved, correct? So we will be working on the environmental assessment, or we have been from the beginning collecting information, collecting your comments, um, and it will be completed if and when the permit is approved. Uh, all EAs that we complete are actually searchable on DEQ's website. So there's a few places that we post posted information in the slideshow or more information about how to search per permit. You can find the actual permit document and the environmental assessment that we want for that. The, the second aesthetics question. For aesthetics, like we talked earlier, we're going to do berms around the entire site and trees at the base of the berm. Uh, I think our spacing over on Zachariah is about 15 feet on our trees. In that those trees will be watered, the grasses will grow two and three feet high. Weed control will be done on an annual basis. It will also be inspected by the county on a regular basis. What about dust control? Uh, that's, that's a good question. So uh, yeah, I think I'll do two of those here. Uh, what about dust control? And then uh, Troy, I'm going to throw in the second one is what are the requirements for air quality around schools? Uh, anything for minimum distance, prevailing winds, et cetera, and also related to that. Great question. So dust control is required in the administrative rules of Montana to apply to these facilities. And that's usually with a production operation like this, there'll be spray waters and water trucks on the roads. Um, and the limit is 10% of capacity. And any time that's 10% or higher, there's a requirement that they use those spray waters and water trucks. Um, as far as schools, that would be off the board in the public purview. We don't have any regulatory authority to say distance from school parks off the road or anything like that. Um, so I would also add on to that often in terms of the zoning question, um, in terms of proximity to schools or other locations. All right, so I'm going to take another question from the audience. I know you've got your hand up. Uh, yeah, regarding the mortgage pit, there's no good site. Uh, how long is the permit uh, time frame for that and where you're going to be planning that pit? Are you going to be operating at full capacity? Is there any expansion? Plan for that site. If Maury Pitt is about done, it's probably got about three years left in it. There's no further expansion, and we will be doing reclamation at that time. Thank you. All right, next question. <laughs> Are you aware? Are you aware? Size of the gravity of the 
and that the metals within are found in the discussed. From agricultural management to fertilizer, again, fertilizer, I mean, there's a fact that we don't need to know the soil focus is a well documented threat, also. Are you aware of local things in areas of the size of the Five stones, the young gateway, the famous gallon belly winds, the current spring of the five hundred miles. All right. You want to respond on that one? Yeah. Can, you, can you repeat the question uh, about basically irrigation? Yeah, the question was are we aware of chemical metals that? I've been involved in the woods and years and conventional activities in the area. And we don't do any high quality or air quality salinity soil analysis. We do have rules for maintaining gut control. And in general, in Montana, from my understanding, the rocks in this region aren't silicon based. If it was concrete batch plant going in there, I would have more concerns about the silicon based. Operated, but generally we we do ensure that these companies are maintaining their dust control by the way. Well, some of the inspections also come on the way we call some of the companies. So I can tell you that we are looking at it, we are making sure that they're all Thanks, Lynette. All right, somebody's going to have to You bet. Thank you so much. And again, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, I have a question for the NTMC people. Um, the law that uh, has been mentioned several times tonight that uh, regulates its operation, I think it's called 1920, uh, 2021 Montana Open Cut Mining Law. You guys know the law information. Yeah, we guys have all the lobbying in the past. Yeah, I'm That's a problem. Yeah. 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 Can you just repeat the question, please, Mara? The question was if water from the new soil and rock, that how is open pit mining not affect groundwater? Um, that's a good question. And I, I will say that in the scheme of things, you know, I've thought about this um, great many for the past couple of weeks. This is going to sound completely odd, but this is relatively benign material. Um, and one thing that we can be sort of presbyterian about is that, and this is all going to sound weird, but the proximity to the Gallatin River uh, to this site, um, the groundwater near that site is made. Oh, a river of water. So it interchanges and is well connected with the groundwater aquifer. So it provides a little bit of a buffer capacity to that, um, to, to what's going on in the groundwater. Um, I don't know the, of the particulars of the downward movement of water through the gravel into the groundwater. But as the as the folks mentioned, groundwater does move to the south. Radiant and um, the distance, the separation from the bottom of the pit to the groundwater table, uh, the distance of 10 feet, uh, I would think would provide some sort of buffer capacity to prevent any sort of contamination from the downward movement of water into the aquifer. Uh, all right, uh, thanks, Lynette. Uh, I just want to clarify something. Okay. Do okay. you think that the groundwater underneath it, the river water, will co-mangle? They do. So that's um, 
That's what right. we the guy. The question is with the groundwater that's not just particular to this location. All right, I'm going to take the next question for this. Will the speed limit be lowered to 55 miles per hour from Gateway to Big Sky? Will turn lanes in both directions be installed? I'm going to kick the turn lanes up for us again. Yeah, so the, the permit application includes a left turn lane northbound and an acceleration south acceleration lane southbound. There is no right turn lane northbound, but there is a, a wide uh, apron into the pit. That's what's going to happen at the at the. <laughs> And I'll look at the speed limit for one second. Right now, I'm pretty sure. Um, I think the question is uh, are, is the speed limit going to be adjusted south of gateway, right? Yeah. Um, so, in. Uh, I think it was 21 for the speed study. Right. December 21, our last speed study was completed that indicated no change to the current speed limit. That said, our speed limits are established based off uh, engineering study. This is industry standard, and uh, that's the, the speed limit. Speed limits are, are defined based off the percentile speed traveling, and, and that takes into consideration the uh, type of facility, the um, classification of the roadway adjacent land we saw and so forth that said we do recognize um context is what it is and uh i i don't know when speed limits would would or could be adjusted however that conversation is being had to evaluate yeah that appropriateness and and uh that's about right now we don't have a plan to lower the speed limit we're referring to our study. Let me clarify. Uh, so I said there is a left turn in front lane northbound. There's an acceleration lane southbound. There is no deceleration lane northbound coming into the pit, but there is a right turn lane right at the approach. Okay, so traffic will be able to go by the right turn truck, but there will be deceleration lane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> South of the is it at the regular road with that other basis, or are you creating a new one part of the south? The question is, are you creating a new turn? Will they be using their current driveway? They will not be using their current driveway, it's further south. Where? Where? And I'm not sure exactly. About halfway between, you know, where the pivot pump is? Out there, where there's an approach now. Question: Where he's at the halfway where the pivot is, right? Okay, one more question here. And again, question you please. Hi, everyone. Um, Casey Gibbons, president of uh, Gateway Conservation Alliance. I have two questions: one for TMC and one for the EQ. The EQ, you repeatedly say this tonight that the onus is more on us as citizens. To refer to you and give you information. Um, if you're looking around this room, uh, one of the statements you made was that they can submit things by the internet and online. Um, that's discriminatory. So I'm wondering how you're addressing that because there's individuals here, my own parents who don't have email and don't have internet. How are you addressing to collect those studies, those wells, all that information that we want to submit in a timely manner? Not with US postal code in a timely manner and not be discriminatory to people on this road. Uh, Whitney, you want to take that? But I can also say uh, you have the ability if you have written comments, you have comments right now, you give them to us. I want to get out online to my study well. Yeah, got it. And again, you can submit those throughout the process, but Whitney. Yeah, the, the best way to submit it is through email, which you said something we'll not have access to. 
uh, or through the mail. But those are the ways that we are able to collect um, comments and information from people over this gigantic state. Okay, so all of that, if someone mails a letter in pre the close date, but you get it after the close date, is it still valid? Comments are always valid, and we keep even the ones that come in after. Sure. I'm talking about if we do a soil study or a well study, if we mail them to you pre your required close date, and it gets to you after the close date because it's going by the mail, is it still valid? We have to consider what we have in front of us. We encourage people to submit comments as soon as possible. Comments and information as soon as possible. So that's enough. That's so that's ultimately, enough. ultimately, we have statutory deadlines that are out like the Open Cup Mining Act that we are required to meet. And so that's why we encourage people to get things to us as fast as possible. That's enough. Thank you. Like that, my question is yes, no. And I will bring the mic around, but if everybody who hasn't asked a question will have a chance to ask a question. And so I need somebody who hasn't asked a question for you. Thank you. My understanding is the um, Montana Department has a requirement of quality and also them and EPA are forbidden to use numbers in their environment assessments. How can you uh, uh, establish the validity of a permit without? Numbers you know, the environment so legislature will bid that, right? I, I can speak to that. No, that's not we use lots of numbers and lots of modeling uh, and working with those studies. So, so someone else has a question, but what about here is do you uh, uh, do you do you do that? I think uh, the folks on the line are asking for what the job requirements are. Mm -hmm. uh, there's first sign of this. Use the word. So the question was whether the folks on the left here have to take classes in stewardship. And that obviously will vary by institution, but I think generally uh, we try to hire well-rounded scientists, um, folks with uh, some exposure to policy and that kind of thing, so that they're not just hard time to be numbers, they understand the implications of the broader sense. And that's what I would say. Our big cut team is extremely well educated and they are paid to poke holes in these applications. Uh, they these applicants just like us just as much as you can. Grab Rob's question there. I'm going to take you to meet me and I've got to step behind a tandem gravel truck. And once the cars between me and the truck and it'll be the way past the gravel truck because we were all stuck behind it. I saw in the back of the gravel truck a sign. Uh, uh, being over 50, I certainly couldn't read it from 300 feet away. But the sign said that all the animals should stay at least 300 feet away from the ground truck because the truck wasn't liable for any damage done to the animals behind that. Now, has Andy, uh, uh, the Department of Transportation, Consider that spacing vehicles on 191 at least 300 feet apart would do, and what it would cost in law enforcement, <laughs> how much you have safety to have space vehicles on 191 at least 300 feet apart. That's recommended that the back of travel trucks in little silence. Thank you, thank you for your question. And I appreciate your back, right? 
and then only three that each other, right? And, and at the end of the day, that looks like what I was saying earlier, that we have to be stewards of each other to, you know, protect your neighbor, be thinking about the person in front of you, behind you, or the side of you, so on and so forth. And, you know, whether it's driving, to answer your question specifically, I've never heard of anything like that. You know, in the industry in general, our design standards do not require that. But again, there's guidelines out there that help people make good decisions, right? And it's just like, you know, just because you can do something, something there doesn't mean you should do it, right? You know, that's what now, now listen. So, along with that, we, we rely and we work as heavily with law enforcement. We also, as we talk about trucks leaving the pit, potentially with rocks that may damage, we, we have our own section of uh, NCS for They do inspections, they stop those trucks, and they do have the ability to find them if they find them doing unsafe things. As far as folks passing those trucks, what we will do, we rely on law enforcement to take care of that. We know we have to keep working with them. Um, in this district, for the proper current condition, we coordinate the title patrol in both major areas and talk about the issue. Hey, uh, we have a question about uh, crystalline silica is produced by travel pit operations and causes harm damage when breathed in and is irreversible and incurable. How does this major health hazard get reconciled with one hand right to a healthy environment and clean air quality? What if uh, the, the crystalline silica reaches the Gallatin River? So, uh, uh, Troy is that first one in here, and then my class is over for water. Thank you. As I stated before, uh, it's generally the rocks and dirt in this area are not silver based. And so that's really not a concern for the air quality side of it. It's more general health than it's a concern for us. Um, and again, I'll say we we have a concrete bank plan for winter concrete. I think it's what it does have a little bit of different concern, but that's not what's going on in the next it's, it's not it's not anything that we're overlooking. Another uh, question is what happens if silica enters the river? Uh, the all silica is a major component of river water chemistry. Uh, it is already in a lot of groundwater in the sea of the valley, uh, in concentrations that vary from low to 20 milligrams per liter. Uh, what would happen if it was uh, incorporated into the stream flow? Um, it would be part of the river, rivers are uh, inherently transport uh, mechanisms. They convey material for high places to low places. And this is all silica uh, would, would walk into the river. It would flow to break down. It's all would be transported, as does uh, most of the other things that the river carries downstream towards the main stack of I'm going to take two online questions. Thank you. And we have a number of questions left. I think we just kind of have about 34 between the written and the online. So um, if there are some that are similar, I think we'll go ahead and put them together. Okay. Um, not keeping you in the top room longer than needed, but why does TNC need to build another pit just a couple miles south of the morning? As we stated earlier, the Morgan Pit is about to be re not reclaimed yet, but it's about to run out of material, probably three years. The gravel pits in Belgrade are running out of material. We chose this site because it's a safer location than crossing 191 than Morgan Pit. One more. Uh, next one online is how do you need to identify any deficiencies in the original application? And if so, we describe them and advise that the applicant has been informed and that they're wrong. Can you talk about a little bit there? Uh, I think we hear from the staff that there have been deficiencies, and then we'll be sent out on an August 9th letter with outline built to the fresh water uh, the worksheet. There will be others. And there are others. Um, so, right now, 
You'll have to wait. So, as we stated earlier, TMC will pay all of the costs for the improvements to this approach. As far as what we do for communities, TMC donates to everything in this town. We support the school. We've supported the sportsman's banquet for years. We donate to the ladies' aid. We donate to the fire department. We donate to the 4-H. We donate to MSU. There virtually is nothing we don't support. Thank you very much. I'm on the line. I'm also part of the uh, Gateway Conservation Society. So, your specific question we will pay for any water quality sample because this is going to be thrust upon our community as well. And so, if if we need to pay for that and want to go well, if that's what they're requiring, we will pay for it also. Now, my question um, I, I do. My question is going to be for MET. I've read the uh, corridor study as well. The very lengthy, very detailed from uh, Hope Water to Beaver Creek. And in the, the top needs and objectives were to reduce fatalities and serious injuries from vehicle crashes, reduce animal vehicle conflicts, reduce roadside hazards, reduce vehicle conflicts, and accommodate wildlife movement. The number one risk to drivers. The drivers with wildlife and religious. Number two, being rear on the highways. So, while the purpose of the market wildlife transportation and partnership planning tool, they've done in 2023, outlines the various threat from gateway to, um, uh, to actors in the corner to Wilson area as a migrants in peril. They said it highlighted and then as one of the most. Dangerous places in Montana already for wildlife collisions. So my question is, what are we going to do to mitigate wildlife collisions with vehicles now without any extra traffic on? And what are we going to do to stop murder and collisions? Keep the two most main deadly things happening on our own. <laughs> I spoke briefly about the feasibility study that we just initiated to evaluate the recommendations that are provided in our corridor study to help us identify some some opportunities to pursue. Now, that goes to your point with respect to wildlife accommodations. Every one of our projects, no matter what its complexity, we there is a wildlife accommodations component that. We take into consideration and we try to make um, opportunities based on project policy and we to, to integrate wildlife accommodations. That said, building a good road takes time. These processes take take time to plan and deliver. Um, right now, there is some funding opportunities, some discretionary dollars that are provided through the current highway bill by IJ8. Those are nationally competitive dollars. There's some folks in the room here that uh, MVP has been working with, in addition to the partnership that you outlined, that uh, is focused on trying to find some of those opportunities. Uh, additionally, um, we've been collaborating with some of the adjacent landowners to find out if there's any 
again, opportunities to provide short term enhancements like that, that will contribute to reduce wildlife vehicle pollutions. It's a challenge. There's not a great solution for any of it. And then, you know, it's like the deer cross here side, right? Um, okay. and, and so rear end pollution, again, hearing loud and clear. Um, driver behavior. When you talk to um, law enforcement, you know when when the fatality happened a couple weeks back. Several of you probably in this room have probably asked questions about what we're doing. And of course, safety is our priority, and and not not our goal, right? Vision zero. When I have my conversations with law enforcement about accidents that they've been on. What they often inform me is that you know it's not the road. There's not something wrong with the road at that particular location. It's driving behavior. Okay. I, I did that, and I can often suggest that possibly reducing that speed limit would help me a lot of those goals that maybe were taken in this Bring that comment forward. I'm going to go through some of the written comments. Uh, there's even a comment about speed limit. I'm going to read some of the written comments you've got. Uh, you've covered a lot about this one. And repetitive question is how to prevent soft percolation of pressure processed water into groundwater. The TMC question How will gravel pit stop percolation of pressure processed water into groundwater? The pressure processing, first off, there is no chemicals used at all. We're using groundwater, crushing rock, and it goes back into the groundwater. It's that simple. How much water does you use in the tank? How much water does it use in a day? 5,000 gallons. Five. We go through about a water truck a day with our spray bars on the crusher. Okay. Uh, Jeff, you another question I asked about the reduction of water usage versus irrigation versus the pit. Okay, so we did some math on the, the, the ranching out there and the water usage. Right now, with irrigation, it uses about 108 million gallons a year. PMC using 5,000 gallons a day for the entire year, we use 1.8 million gallons. That's quite a bit of water sale. I take the question off here. Uh, was there, if you repeat the follow up question, okay. Wait. Wait. I'm going to take a couple of these other ones here on the written ones. Please help me understand the security material. How many trucks would that build? Thank you. Hands on how big a truck. So I get, I think somebody here's done math and they came out with 40,000. I don't do 400,000. And a cubic yard is 1.6 times. Okay, very good. You did your homework. And I, I will read this question. We, we've already answered it. MBT did it as thoroughly answered this one. This is a hellish trapped area for uh, wildlife crossings. What will happen to elk herds that occupy this area related to wildlife crossings? I know MBT has addressed that. Is there anything FWP would add on to that? Specific question what would happen to elk herds as a result of this project? And like I've said before, we, we try to deal with what we know. In fact, we know this to be a reduction in about 130 acres uh, of elk winter range. that will have to find some more. Uh, next, how does the environmental 
of quality account for the impact of quality of life for all the people and why is life impacted by a relative in our in our home. So this goes back to the environmental assessment. Um, again, for the application, we look at what is required of the applicant with the Open Town Mining Act that allows some mitigations, but not all the mitigations that everyone wants. Uh, the environmental assessment looks at a number of resources, including aesthetics, which we've talked about a couple of times tonight. Um, and again, NEPA is procedural, so it doesn't mean we can mitigate it, but we do identify and analyze and disclose those impacts. Sure, I think this one is so the question here is if if the DEQ can do nothing based on the environmental review, why even complete it? Um, for one, it's required. NEPA requires us to do it by law. And number two, it's a communication device to identify, analyze, and disclose impacts for the people to be able to understand what, what is going to happen near their own. Uh, a quick one for MDT. When will MDOT's traffic study be completed? If, if, if we're speaking, I'm assuming the traffic study for the approach. Yeah. Okay, so our process is in queue right now. So there is that approach permit is being evaluated by department staff for completeness and coordination of the final uh, content of that is, is, is on the way. And I don't have the date for when it's completed. Okay. Um, I don't know that either. I'm not the right staff right now simply because it's those dates are established as a function of what the views come in. So we have a timeline in which we have to respond with our comments. And if there's comments that need to be corrected, then they have a timeline. Of course, the process goes back and forth in a collaborative effort. Okay. But I, maybe some clarification there is that the approach permit isn't fully executed until the mitigation has been completed. So the mitigation in this case would be the turn of maze, the construction of those turn of maze would need to be completed before the I will give you comments, but I want to give these two that I have right for the CMC. Uh, what is the relationship between the landowners and uh, CMC who applied for the permit? Who retains mineral rights? The landowner only retains his mineral rights. We have a contract with a, uh, a royalty agreement. Uh, and back, back to the basics with so many gravel pits in this area, why is this necessary and who does actually, who does the pit actually benefit? Why is this necessary? The demand is in this valley, we all have homes built, a lot of them by gravel from TMC. Uh, all the roads in our areas. Why do we need more? Because the pits in Belgrade and the other pits are running out. Who benefits? Who benefits? All of us. Okay, Hawk Hill, that road, that gravel road. That's right there. That's where you live, right there. Yeah, so I think they maintain that road, don't we? You played that road? Yep, used to for years. Um, it's built on gravel. Um, I live down here in Gateway, 400 yards from the Gateway Pit. Been there since 05. Never had an issue with it. And that was long before I worked here. Um, so the other pits are not in a location that is inappropriate in a residential area and will have massive impact and no benefits to the rest of us. My family owns the property directly north. Right along the Black's property. We have been friends for years. The elves run back and forth. But this location is not appropriate in this area. Okay, we can guarantee the waterfall. You said you're going to dump the, the pressure water into the gallows. I did not say I was dumping no. pressure water into the gallows. Are you going to? No. Wait. It no, it's going into the ground. I never said it was going into the gallery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
using the microphone already. My question is on the reclamation. I think, like in 20 years, I'll be 48. Is there a cost of living that goes with that? I'm assuming that 20 years from now, that that gives us a thousand dollars in living. Yeah, so that's great. That's a great question. Uh, so again, six hundred thousand dollars or six hundred thousand, almost seven thousand, seven hundred thousand is for the first part of the mining. The first phase is the southern half of the pit, so it's not to cover the whole thing. It's just to cover that first half. They can only mine that portion until they tell us they're going to move into the other part, and then they have to potentially give us a holding bond. So DEQ has the ability to reassess the block map over time. I'm going to take uh, another online question. The 50 acres recently developed on Highway 191 at Cottonwood has 200 new families. Assuming the same density, a lot of property could be developed for 500. What is the difference in Highway 191 traffic for 500 families versus one traffic? <laughs> Uh, it's a great question, but we don't have an answer right here. So, so by Gallatin County standards, a single family home has 10 acres per day. So you can do the math. That's how many homes, that's how many trips. That's an estimate, that's how many trips it's coming from. So, yeah. Yeah. Today is what the Alton County requires for their subdivision. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you for the uh, My name is Dave Donahue. I'm an agrogeologist with Hydro Solutions, and I, you've got my foot in there, but I was going to read that in um, So I've been uh, asked to review the application by the Gateway Official Alliance. Um, I, I did submit, I submitted comments um, today online, the new um, several pages of it. But my comment or my question right now to uh, stay within the rules tonight are related to the groundwater. We've heard a lot about that and answered some questions, but my question relates to what is um, the, the information that was used to establish the groundwater, the depth of groundwater at a site. So there's several, um, there's a report that's referenced in there by uh, the USGS label uh, 1993, which indicates that the groundwater levels that were used in the application are 30 years old. The actual data was by the end of So my question along those lines is why was it more recent water level data from wells that have been drilled with surrounding the pertinent area and you need to establish that what the depth of water level is in the um, area of the mine. We have wells that are south of there, we have wells that are to the uh, uh, surrounding there, the water levels that are less than 20 feet deep reported, um, and in fact, owned by uh, the landowners themselves, like some of the well lots in Keyway. The other question that relates to fluctuation of the groundwater. It's documented in Gallatin um, Water Quality District. Uh, wells that exist north of, of uh, the facility and south of the facility several miles, but it still shows that there's fluctuating the groundwater level on a seasonal basis since, as measured since 2007 is, uh, of over 20 feet in fluctuation from the sea. That's going to impact the depths to shallow groundwater. Those are questions that I'm not sure why they weren't addressed in the application and they told the state that that was available to the ground service 
groundwater levels um, were established with a couple of methods. One was the, the study you referenced, which is the 95 study, a slide study, um, and that compared that to the founders on the ground, and that got us one elevation. And then we verified with GWIG with groundwater wells and static water levels in those wells around the area and correlated the two. And we did made a conservative estimate on groundwater data. That's how we did it. That's what we're that's what is required by the permit permit application. Um, I understand that we're probably going to give a deficiency that's going to request more information, and we will whatever is required, we'll get that additional. Can I ask you a follow-up on that? Short sure, follow up to that. Yeah, my name is Michael. The groundwater debate and any potential transport contaminants that might come into the site cannot really be adequately assessed without at least three wells around the site. Um, why not make a commitment? Install three monitoring wells around the site, sample them for and share the results given the value of the groundwater here in Dallas, given the interest in the same press here tonight. Um, that seemed to be a, a great step to take in that direction. I'd also be interested in what um, water is used for, you know, for the area that has an exempt well or permitted well. And, um, how that um, might be handled by the state. As we walk up there, a little bit of an uh, well is my understanding, and that's handled through the MRC process, which we all might not need to do, but in terms of the uh, monitoring and the overseas. Okay, so on the Blacks property, there are one, two, three, four wells now. Five. Some of them are 30 feet below the elevation of this proposed bed. Excuse me? Only one is locked. Oh, it's a bridge. Sure about that. Possibly. Um, thing we've heard in the past, we, they don't tell us what deficiencies we're going to get. We done this long enough, we know what deficiency we're going to get. We've already committed to putting two more monitoring wells in, which will give us a triangulation on that piece of property. I contacted the well driller last week. We're six weeks away from getting those wells. So there will be other monitoring wells on there. Yes, one will be on the west edge of the pit. One will be on the east edge of the pit. There's a black well in the southeast corner. And we have the other well in the northwest corner on the lower level right behind the hay barn. So we actually will have four wells. And we will monitor. And for our own protection, we will sample on a regular basis. Morrison Merrily will be our engineers that will take care of all of that for us. Thanks. Um, so they are required to send a uh, letter to submit a letter from Shigo. Um yeah, Pat turned the letter in with the ship all clear. So, what's ship all? Yeah, yeah. Ship all is the artifacts. Um, ship all is the artifacts, whether there were Indians there, things like that. It's state historical preservation office. So, they are part of that process. And it has been, so it has been reviewed. So, they have submitted their paperwork to the state historical preservation office. And it has been reviewed on that front. And then take a note about these very much. So, uh, is TMC locally owned? If so, for how long? How many pits have you ever reclaimed? And have you ever lost or forfeited a bond? 
PMC is a locally owned company, been here, actually started in Gallatin Gateway 30, over 30 years ago. Uh, families that own it have been in Gateway for generations. We have reclaimed one, two, three, four pits, five with Williams. We have never, what was the last part? No, we have never forfeited a bond. We've never even had a DEQ infraction. So um, I think that's pretty good. Wayne, what's your question? So I appreciate everything you guys are doing. I know it's really strange, but I appreciate the a couple of different engagement people mentioned about auditing. Let's go audit frequency. The other house. How do we know this problem? How are the name? How are people in the neighborhood? Before? Same thing with the well. It's a good move to add an iron as well. We'd love to know what the DOJ is from San We'll send it into the DEQ. We're not there. How do we get it? You go to the DEQ website, it's all public information. Here, we'll let me keep your time without their happy to. So, uh, auditing or we call it inspections, right? Uh, we have over 1,500 sites in the state, and I don't have enough scientists to go to every single one of them. So, we try to focus in on ones that we know have had trouble in the past, newer um, operators that may need more guidance, um, and then try to hit. From random ones. So we do let folks know we're coming most of the time, um, but only usually like a week's notice. Um, we try to see them semi regularly, especially if we know there are issues and make sure I get all your questions here. Um, in terms of knowing what's found, we don't publish the inspection reports online, but they are all public information. So you can just submit a FOIA request through the DEP website um, and we would be able to release that information. All right, I'm going to get back here. Thank you for your patience. Um, this is kind of a bold question for our community of people. I'll have some comments at the end, and this is the question of the person who is unbelievable questions we can ask. This can be asked. First one is when's the last time you wondered where? Excuse me, John. Hi, my name is Marty. I have a 
help off and off the all drive my neighbor. Really good neighbor. Um, thank you for I can see you your neighbor. I'm not from Montana, but my wife is. And her one, her grandmother died 104 last year, lived her own life, right? She's from Montana. My, my father in law was standing here next to me and finally left him sitting around his home. He grew up in Montana his whole life. And he was for 30 years, ran uh, maintenance of the highway to go. The road, sorry. Um, I'm just talking about you, right? And what I preach is to my team as an educator, as a leader, give more than you receive in life. Find a way to give more than you receive. And then it doesn't matter how much money you have to you live in a rich life. And it, like, we moved out here, we inherited this land here, and we couldn't put a gas station there. And all our neighbors were worried about that. Like, what are we going to do with our land? And what are we going to do with our home? And we looked around it. And we knew we landed the market for the out since 1976. And, and we were honored to live out here. And we were, I, I'm from Detroit. It's like all my friends and oh, we want to do the Yellowstone land. I haven't watched the channel. So I don't know. But the peace and quiet quality of life is the reason why we didn't put a gas station. Why we can sell our land, break it off in pieces, and, and cash out and go to Florida and hang out and live off of retirement. We said this is a We're going to stay here. And what do we do? We, we remodeled our land. We remodeled the home. We were hoping that our son, he just got married, we grew up in Montana, born and raised here, will one day live on that land. And it's disturbing to me to see that something so pristine over money, over government, over a governor that is supposed to protect our land will slide something through where you people have no say to do your job. Your hands are done. So I have a question. Okay. I have a very important because I think most of the time they do what I do. I'm not trying to agree with you. I thank TMC for everything you've done in this community. I know the families, that family that was standing here that's part of that. I know all those three families that are and everything. They come up the families mind. Our local base community is special. We might see things differently, but I stood next to this guy and considered him a neighbor and a friend. And if he had a problem, I don't care what he had. I can write your door, step out, me out, change your tire on the road, whatever you need. And that's what I thought my team used to see about. That's what I really thought. Giving more than you receive in life is a great way to live. And my question to you guys, and it relates to that, and I, and I respect you, I respect the good run college. You guys know what you're doing, you know how to do this. But my question is, Something that was asked of the very point. Are you willing to go on record in a public setting to say that TMC did not give any money to lobbyists to get that bill passed? That's my question. Thank you. I believe they already answered that and said no. I'm not saying that they're giving it to them. Did you provide them? Did they go on record? I will go on record that TMC did not give any money to a lobbyist. Thank you very much. <laughs> what? Thank you very much for Appreciate that. All right. Uh, next, uh, I'm going to read this one. I believe it looks like the, the uh, Seattle and Boca Water Quality District official has to step away and leave. Is that true? So yeah, I, so. I just want to get this question and ask so we can get a follow up. Uh, 2016 by the Seattle and Water Quality District found elevated levels of arsenic in Seattle County, in particular. Areas near the Gallup Gateway, is there any monitoring of metals in the soils that are proposed to get or assessment of metals in the soil prior to the permit approval? I don't know if TMC wants to speak to that or you want me to follow up with Gallup on that front? Yeah. Gallup? All right. Uh, next, uh, I've got, I'm going to go online for a question. Okay, the next online question is the proposed mining plan to have stormwater or snow melt flow into the proposed pit area and cannot be the permitted effect. The question is, is it is the stormwater or snow melt proposed to not be the effect? The entire site will be burned, which means no water can leave the site. 
And we do have a stormwater permit application being put together. I think we can turn it into a permit option. Mm -hmm. I believe we did. And you can say, uh, next one is just how many additional trucks will be on the road every day because of this? None. Uh, yes. Why does this site look so close to the residents moving further away? That's their property line. That's that's where that's the limits of their property. My address, uh, my house is 108. Can you test the interval where we live for 50 years? Well, do you want to live there? I actually looked at where your house is, and you will notice that we put our stockpile, our overburden and soil stockpile back there, and your setback will be more like 300 feet. I don't believe you have to. Well, you, you don't have to. I don't believe you'll stick for that. Um, and TMC, you can say to, uh, I think you may have already addressed some of these. When did TMC start as a company? How many people do you employ? Uh, I did address that about 30 years ago. We have 45 people. Are they local? Is TMC local? TMC, the owners of TMC were born and raised in Gallatin Gateway. Does TMC TMC employs all local workers? Can you tell us in do you repeat this question? Where is this gravel going to be used? Where is this gravel going to be used? Throughout Gallatin County, some will go to Madison County. This guy's going to break his arm back here. <laughs> I'm sorry to answer the question. Thank you. Um, if you want to second our attorney's comment, I want to say that uh, no, there's, there should be any animosity that's moving towards the public officials in the state because you are tasked with committing very bad law. There should be no animosity against TMC because you're doing what you're doing. You're doing what you're trying to do. Trying to sustain the company and create jobs. There should be no animosity against the blacks because they're trying to sustain the rank. Our job is to use the real options and get out of it. How to get the person in the past. These questions, oh, Senator, all the team. Thank you. Thank you. Back from you and uh, as general lawyers, okay. so I can I ask questions to the local representative? Okay, so uh, last week, uh, Representative Garner, who was the chief sponsor of the public record rewrite in 2021, said he did not intend for it to uh, pertain to locations next to homes where people live. Um, obviously, the law not written and expected to fix. Um, I also have a question about constitutionality of the state because the state guarantees us um, two different places uh, safe environment, healthy environment, and it requires um, state government to uh, provide ways for the citizens to act on that. 599 doesn't do that. Um, constitutionally, I'm concerned because I think citing this area of taking a private property right to keep home today. I have a lot that's a mile away. Two days before the letter got our mailbox, a gentleman named Black made an offer I thought, whole ball. And he said, Well, I'm concerned about some things that are gonna happen down the bed I feel So I know that certain people, principals here, know that this is gonna have property rights. What conversation did you guys have to stay? I think Senator Flowers, you're probably on the right side of the issue when it came up two years ago. Um, we heard about all traffic deaths. Um, in 2018, I tried to, I had to find a fund for a while back in the past. That was going to be a fund to help protect the neighbors who did not set a road. Through this, this is the last, this place, we thought it was going to be the last place where we could have a bus. To demonstrate that this is the human health of the traffic on this highway, the environmental impacts, 
So my question for you is what kind of structures are you guys having to change this law? Constitutionality. A judge in the rule of the last week from an introduction on another one because the constitutional question. And this is the kind of thing I'm going to talk about later this morning. Thank you. Great questions. Um, I can tell you that I argued against House Bill 599. I voted against House Bill 599 and it passed um, despite my objections and my, uh, some of my Democrat colleagues on the committee. Um, this is on the Senate Committee. Um, there was discussion about impacts on the Jason and Miami Millers and um, Senator Representative Anderson. Um, Fair enough, I'll we'll take his uh, statement at face value, but it's hard to imagine how this wouldn't affect the Jason plan owners. And that was my question earlier. That was what was focused on my mind. How, in environmental assessment, would you consider the impact on reduction in value for Jason plan owners? And at what level is that reduction does it trigger an environmental impact statement? And uh, you know, it's probably a left field question for the department, and I'm not prepared to answer, but I think it's an important question. And I think they have to look at change property values. Is those are real, and all of you who live near this potential site know just how real that is, especially given the elevated um, property values of all these. Okay, Jennifer Boyer, um, Washington County Commission. So currently, the um, state statute, unless an area of the zone is residential, that doesn't mean it has to be high density residential, it has to be zoned as residential. Um, you cannot, um, okay, you cannot, um, that's the only condition in which you can deny that an open cut mine is if it's zoned residential. Other, if there's a different zoning, you can allow that by a conditional use permit. Um, and so that in that way, then you can mitigate potential impacts through like the labor policies and site and noise and lighting and all of those types of things. So um, the county is working on implementing our growth policy where we launched our future land use map as the first step in developing a more comprehensive approach to land use. Uh, up next, we have can you explain why uh, not more than one method was used for determining water levels in German water to you? <laughs> I already answered this. I believe that there were two methods. We used the study, the 1995 study, the study, and we also looked at the groundwater level in well from the groundwater information center and the static water level. We compared that to the study, and that's how we came up with our estimated groundwater. Uh, will the EQ hold a public hearing for this permit, and why not? This is a public meeting, so the required the statutorily required public meeting on this. We went through the question and answer process. Uh, we are accepting public comment throughout the process. And so this, this is your meeting our requirements to on a quick meeting and public hearing. And we are meeting the requirements of the floor in holding this meeting and taking your public comments through the process, taking your questions. Uh, we have shared a remarkable amount. We want to be able to answer all of your questions to assist us in making an informed decision on this application, completing an informed environmental assessment on this proposal. I greatly appreciate all the feedback you have provided us this evening. I think you owe the, this panel a round of applause. We want to welcome the At the NRC, we had the applicants here, and we see the really appreciate it. So we as well. Um, we understand these are requirements in the open council, however, the open council also makes uh, these decisions on other agencies. So there's no requirement to 
wonderful speakers. They're, they're volunteering to come in and answer the questions. And yeah, thank you and I really much appreciate it. So, yeah, three more questions online. Those three questions online. And then Does the DOT have any plans to install a light at the main gateway intersection or make any other improvements to the safety of the intersection between four corners and the entrance? Yeah, so I earlier I spoke to we have a project coming at the intersection of Mill and Rabel for it's currently planned to be a civilized intersection. Um kind of reconstruction will be dependent upon the completion of the design it's available funding, but that is a district priority to get that in as soon as practical. So when a good project takes time, you can anticipate, you know, when we can get to it in 18 to 24 months, likely to be what it takes to be transparent. Uh, the the little bridge right to the north of the uh, way station at the same service ditch, we have that nominated for removal and replacement to a wider structure to remove that bottleneck that's not a coming to our program. Uh, the next one I spoke to earlier, there's a turn, uh, two way left turn lane, turn lanes project between Zachary and Hooch that uh, we constructed next summer and we've been building today. Uh, we have a Spanish Creek Bridge project planned for reconstruction. Um, this summer we're doing the pavement the next summer of pavement preservation project south of Spanish Creek in the canyon. And uh, back to our quarter study and our feasibility study that we're working on, we'll continue to evaluate project needs and nominate projects um, as we normally do. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're gonna wrap up our opening question. I can add short one to the um, I think you're both can. Why do TNC rock truck drivers use the southbound shoulder of 191 at their acceleration lane when exiting Morgan pits? And then the second question is what is the reason for developing the pit in the southern portion of the property? Yeah, so I think one will answer the other. Uh, the reason for developing this pit down here is because we can make a right hand turn to get to Big Sky. We can use an acceleration to safely merge into traffic. Gateway pit, honestly, no one will give us a break. And to try to avoid a rear end collision, they move over to let these crazy drivers by. And where that that's over online question? Thank you. All right, I know we have a question here. And again, that's such a couple of questions. <laughs> yeah, after listening, um, Mark Pedrian, after listening to the real concerns, my question is quite simple. What would it would you consider that and TMT doing not doing this? What what would be uh, given all you heard tonight? Uh, finding another site, uh, not not proceeding with it. Well, that, I think it's more like they already started with this. And if, if my good neighbors are just trying to keep zoning me every time, and I just ask to not that the zone, the county commissioners at that point, but the county commissioners are the commissioners, they're going to zone skip. We want to do this. I mean, this time for that we want to not that every thousands of dollars to practice in some college students. And about the element, I mean, it's just a question of all the teachers. You know, we pay the dollars for the damage that we get. We can see a bit of something. I mean, how much of the other facility for a baby to ask me? Yeah, they could fill it on a pin slide. They don't get none of that. They don't get lots of us. You should have problems. Wave problems. Scratch problems. And then we have another neighbor who's right to have us tonight. They're selling their property. Still at the best price around 19. But for subdivision, the best part of the better is to the same level of market. 
So, Question already that has a question. And again, repeat these three questions. How will we do to ensure that the voluntary engagement that has been offered by the community a legal team? Hear that question? Uh, how will the EPO ensure that the, the uh, items that were committed to are we have legal team? So, any of the mitigation tactics that TMC has um, uh, mentioned that they're going to be implementing, uh, once they're included in the permit application, which they've um, indicated that they will do uh, after the division letter is sent out, they will update the application. Letter or the application with those mitigations. And once it's in the application, we um, do have the authority to regulate it. Um, if those mitigation tactics that are mentioned in the application aren't being implemented, um, we will issue that each other. All right. Um, you, anybody else who hasn't asked a question yet? Who has one? Who would like to ask one? Okay. And then I'll, I'll start. Yes, I would like to ask, what is a volume you have a tank you'll have on site? <laughs> and what type of tank will be used on site? And then the spill prevention plan and second, secondary containment. Uh, it's based in terms of fuel tank that will be on site in the mitigation. Yes, we do have a spill prevention plan. All our tanks are double wall tanks. In this particular site, we will put a double wall tank inside concrete containment. We use the bottom of septic tanks. We don't want a fuel spill any more than you do. We have fuel uh, spill kits at all our fuel stations. Our employees are trained as to what to do, who to call if something is ever to happen. An accident, I mean, we've all seen crazy accidents, but. We do use double wall and concrete containment. Excuse me. A uh, thousand gallon tanks. We'll have a thousand at the crusher and a thousand at the scale house. Well under, um, you know, we would never do this, but underneath the spill legal limit by a long ways. So. All right. <laughs> Concerned noise study from the highway, then uh, we'll have this here. Comments about passing the front end. Anybody can receive? I don't have the answer to the end. I'm not going to go to the response to the noise study and what those requirements, what those requirements are specifically. However, um, with project development and capital improvement projects, it has triggered the need for evaluation of the noise study in specific locations, and that is the standard for uh, project development type of So, the core looks as, as a whole, 
Um, no, I'm not aware of any study that the candidates is evaluating when we are funding. Available to evaluate. Sure. Paragraph. Yeah. 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 And we can talk about my question. All right, any last questions that folks want to ask for? One more? Okay, last one. Uh, the trucks again. How many trucks do you see exiting this pit on the How many pits do you see exiting? Yeah. Uh, Urban operations manager, I deal with a lot of logistics and travel things. Um, it's going to vary from day to day. It's not hard to get an average on how many trucks are actually going to need. I do believe we put a number in there that possibly you could see as many as 300 come in in, in a day. That's definitely one possibility. 300 rails. There's We've had 300 tickets at our morning pit. I, don't, I can't say that's how many we've had at this pit, but it's a possibility. Thank you for calling. Well, thank you all. One, one more question. Oh, sorry. And then we got to write it up. I'm going to lines about the number and the number. Um, they're your truck and have those lines placed this side and some of them, but maybe not all, but do they have that sign to stay back for you to see, which is a football field? Yeah. So the question was, do the trucks have the signs that stay back at 300 feet? And the answer was yes. Wait. Are the trucks covered? Our side downs are all, we require our side downs to cover. Side trucks and side downs. Side downs. Side downs. Other questions? Any other questions? Any other questions? Any other questions? Did everything go uh, in PMC a lot in favor? And all the deficiencies in that. When are we looking for this to start? Six months, two years, my lifetime, what? I might know. We can have the uh, speak to that in terms of their objectives. Obviously, a lot depends on how quick we get through the pro permitting process. Um, we would hope next summer. And in terms of the EQ process, when you outline that, we need to wrap up. Do you want to go over kind of the process one more time in terms of the EQ timelines, where we're at, the office and efficiency and next steps? So the first efficiency letter has to go on August 9th. And from there, they have up to one year to respond to us, or they could respond to us in two days. It just kind of depends. When we get that back in, we have 10 days to do another review and either issue another deficiency letter or we can confirm it. So the timeline really depends on what they give us back and whether it meets the requirements of the law. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you for all your good questions. Thank you for that. It was really great. Thank you. Thank you.